Okay, well, our next discussion now is value-based healthcare, and I'd like to introduce you now to Professor Frank Sullivan. Professor Frank Sullivan is a practicing consultant, radiation oncologist in the West of Ireland. He's a special interest in improving the quality and value of care for men with prostate cancer. And uh, without further ado, please welcome Professor Frank Sullivan. Good afternoon, good afternoon, and thank you very much, Emer, and thanks particularly to Martin and Martina and the team for inviting me to speak. I've, I'm honoured to be on this such a distinguished panel, and I want to congratulate you, Martin, on the meeting and on the strategy, and wish you all the best for your tenure. We'll give you every support we can. And I'm conscious I have a heavy responsibility because it's I'm the only person between you and the rest of your lives uh, this <laughs> afternoon. Uh, so I'd like you to hang with me for 10 minutes if you can. Um, Value-based healthcare might sound like uh, an eye-shutting moment, but I'd like to try and convince you that it's not. Uh, when I was leaving the house this morning, uh, I, I reached for this jacket, which I haven't worn for about a month, and it had, um, it had a little badge on it which says UCC, because I'm, yes, I'm another Cork person. And I was at my, the reason I left it on is I was at my 40th medical school reunion uh, a month ago. I can't believe it, but I came out of med school in 1982. So I'm kind of winding down my practice now. In the next few years, my practice will, will be handed on to my colleagues. Um, uh, and I'm, uh, unlike Neve, who I thought did a fabulous job uh, with the last talk, I'm at the tail end of my career. But I'm even more excited now than I have been at, I was at the beginning because I think what's really needed is change and innovation. Because although we do lots of things well, there's for sure a lot we need to do better. So why should we care about value-based healthcare? What is it? I'd like to try and take a few minutes to explain it uh, as best I can to you. And I'm going to give you the answer as I see it. Um, we should care about value-based healthcare because if you care about what outcomes that matter to patients, then really this is, a, this is a strategy and a framework for us to get there. And if we care about sustaining healthcare and keeping costs under control and allowing us to continue to look after patients, we have to change the way we're doing business. So value-based healthcare to me is a compelling structure and framework that allows us to think differently about how we focus our, our efforts in healthcare. A few disclaimers, I still do a little bit of consulting with some of my pharma and medical device companies. I put up ICHAM in November. ICHAM is the International Consortium for Health Outcomes Measurement. It's a non-profit and Movember clearly is a wonderful cancer charity out of Australia. I, 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 um, I do some, a lot of work with them and they've they have um, really informed my thinking. I don't get paid by them, of course, but they really have helped shape how I think about how we might things better. And I'm found, because I'm interested in, in changing this topic and changing this MO of how we practice healthcare and realize that data management is a huge part of it, as I'll show you today, I'm starting and helping to start a kind of a free data system, which we hope will help us all to do a better job of gathering the data we need to improve the quality and the outcomes in healthcare. So what would I like to get across to you? Uh, some understanding of what the framework and how it differs from the traditional frameworks and critically how we measure quality. Because if we can't measure outcomes and outcomes are critically dependent on the quality of the care we're delivering, then we, we've lost any tool we have to influence things. I'm going to show you some data from our prostate cancer program done here in the west of Ireland. And as I look around, some of them may be gone, but some of my colleagues from uh, the university, Sharon Glynn, um, Johnny Newell is there, um, uh, Mona and Davoud and, and um, Aidan, our PhD students that worked with me on much of this data and I owe them a, a big debt and uh, particularly all our patients a big debt because they freely gave their data and their information and they're participating in this very enthusiastically to help us craft this information. So I'll lay out the framework why we should do it differently and then I critically I think talk about some of the barriers to adoption. What's stopping us from doing this differently and how we might solve that. So obviously no country has a, has a perfect health system. We know the US, uh, although Michael did a fabulous job of selling it earlier on, has much, is spending a ton of money and one would argue some of their important metrics in healthcare are not where any of them, would, any people would want them to be. We have fully public systems like the NHS in the UK and Slauncha Care and HSE here. We have blended systems, we have insurance-based systems. Nobody does this correctly. So clearly the models aren't working the way we'd like them to work into the future. Now, there's one thing for sure, we're spending a ton of money in healthcare in Ireland. Um, this is from uh, just a recent press, and you can see 21 billion, I believe, is what's been allocated for the budget this year. 
in the same year, we're going to gather something like 69 billion in taxes. So almost a little short of one in three euros in this country are spent in health. Um, and, and the rest is for everything else we do. So clearly, this is a massive consumer of our budget and our resources, and we better be spending them wisely, hence the concept of, of getting better value. Now, a lot of my thinking was shaped by this man, Michael Porter, um, and I, I'll talk more about him, but he started talking about this back in 2010 and wrote a paper which I read at that point, and I thought, wow, this is, he's right, he's dead right, we should be doing it differently. Um, and the f much discussion and much work has gone on ever since. But I think it's fair to say, although he would say otherwise, it's not exactly spreading like wildfire around the globe. People are talking about it, but they're not really doing it in, in a way that I think is making a difference just yet. And my question is why and how do we change that? So I'm going to just show a two-minute video. I, I, I could give you several slides in value-based healthcare, but... Michael Porter is a friend to us here in this project in Ireland. He has adv advised us and been on several courses at his facility in Harvard and in Boston. He's advised us. He takes a keen interest in what we're doing. And a few years ago, when Tony O'Brien was the um, director general of the HSE, uh, he brought over Michael Porter's team to advise the country on switching to a value-based healthcare program, and nothing happened. Um, um, I was doing some work with our team in prostate and, and uh, Tony heard about that and asked me to come and give a talk and Michael Porter kindly um, gave us a little introduction to the talk and I've taken two minutes because it really he does a beautiful job of explaining what it is and how we should get there. Can you um, roll it there Colette as they used to say? <laughs> in the... We believe very strongly that there's only one goal that makes sense and that's the goal of value for the patient the outcomes that we're actually able to deliver for patients that matter to them relative to how much money we have to spend to do all the services and all the interventions required to achieve those outcomes. If we're improving value, we're succeeding in healthcare. If we're not improving value, we're failing no matter what else we're doing. Now, as we think about value-based healthcare, there's a number of kind of critical concepts that uh, I know you have been exposed to, many of you, uh, uh, in Ireland. Uh, one is that when we think about creating value, we got to think about creating value not for hospitals or for clinics, uh, but around patients and around their patient medical conditions. Um, you can't even talk about value for a hospital. You, you really got to the, get to the level of conditions. If we're going to create value around conditions, we've got to organize our care delivery around those conditions over that full cycle of care. We can't have the current fragmented, fractured structure where patients are moving from place to place and lots of individual actors are uh, trying to help them. We've got to really organize around the need, around the patient's condition. Um, and most importantly, in some ways, uh, we have to measure outcomes. If we're not able to measure whether we're actually succeeding in improving the health results that matter to the patient, ultimately we lose our most powerful tool for improvement. Now, where is Ireland in the value-based healthcare uh, journey? Um, I think Ireland, it, it's fair to say, is just getting started. Uh, that said, there the is way. already an early example of success, and that's around the area of prostate cancer. One clinician who was very motivated, uh, working with Movember, uh, a leading uh, patient advocacy organization in prostate cancer, has actually uh, started the process of creating a registry uh, in Ireland around prostate cancer that is measuring outcomes, but not just local outcomes that we dreamed up uh, that are only applying to Ireland, but outcomes that are global standards in which Ireland has actually been a major contributor uh, through the involvement of, of your clinician uh, leaders in this field. Uh, this is an opportunity uh, to accelerate outcome improvement in prostate cancer uh, in the country. Um, uh, an important uh, disease that aff affects many uh, Irish citizens. Uh, it's also an opportunity for Ireland to not just think uh, locally, but actually start to compare itself with some of the best uh, prostate cancer providers in the world, like Martini Clinic uh, in Germany. So I think he, he set it up beautifully for us here um, in, in very succinctly the role, changing something to a value-based structure means you've got to measure outcomes and you really have to measure quality. That means you essentially have to ask people in a structured way how we did with their interventions. We call them patient-reported outcome measures and they're proliferating everywhere. 
around healthcare now. Unfortunately, I'd like to say there are probably many of them sitting in drawers. They don't find their way out of the, um, rarely find their way out of the office drawer back to the patient to give them the insights as to how their treatments have gone, how they compare with other uh, patients who have had the same kind of treatment. And that's the problem. We're not really getting this information fed back. Now, there's a, when you look at the challenges of doing this, it's not easy to do. I've been at this now for nearly 15 years, and I see some colleagues around the audience who've helped, me, helped us with this. You give the patients the forms, you mail them out, you give them, they fill them in, they send them back in. There are a bunch of numbers, you put them, you collate them, but what really does that do for the, the patients? And that highlights the difficulty is that we're drowning in data, we're drowning in data in healthcare, and it's not really a valuable. And if you look at the challenges for adopting a value changes to a value-based healthcare, there are six of them listed here, and three of them are centered around data. There's an uh, effective data is not stored, is not used. It's still uh, analog. It's still paper-based in many places. Where it is digital, I work in the Galway Clinic predominantly these days, and they have a very high integration in uh, electronic health records, um, uh, particularly using Meditech, which is a, a very powerful tool. But if you go into Meditech, you still find you've got reports, flat PDFs. They're not, the data is not analyzable. You can't really do much with it. So even where electronic health records are being used, the data is siloed. It's not manageable and usable and reportable. This third item listed here is an also a big problem, and that's a cultural shift that's required. And that's why I'm really pleased to be able to speak to this group today, because maybe our generation hasn't quite embraced that, maybe the next generation will. That is, we have to change the way we think about uh, interacting with our patients. We have to not be afraid to show them how we've done, how they've done, what their outcomes have been, how their outcomes might compare with other hospitals and other doctors, so that they know they have some comfort around what's, what's transpired. So a cultural shift really has to start occurring, and that's going to be a long-running battle. But with groups like this focused on it, and the next generation of healthcare workers and educators, maybe we can start to be more transparent in what we're doing. Finally, it's how does the patient engage with this data? And when you think about it, it's all about the patient. We say that repeatedly. But who knows the least about what's going on in healthcare? In many instances, you nearly think Michael, Port, Michael Dowling referred to them as consumers. They're almost closer to being the product in the healthcare industry when you think about it. Hospitals move them, doctors move them around, clinics move them, they go into GP, they go in and out of facilities. But in many instances, do they really know what's happening to them? Do they really have the power to say, ah, if I knew all that, maybe I'd make a different choice. Maybe I'd choose treatment A versus B. And I really think with time has come to open the channels up and share openly with our patients exactly what we're doing with them. It's a kind of an effort to democratize the, the healthcare system so patients have a real vote and they're not just in an asymmetric battle where the industry and the doctors and the hospitals and the nurses know all about them, but they really don't. And I think this is a big part of the problem. So let me just give you a quick example. This is kind of the cool part in the last five minutes, if I can is a real-world evidence. This has never been shown before. I'd ask you to bear with us as Louis comes up here and, and connects our database. So this, this is the real outcomes of 1,500 men that I've had the privilege of being looking after for the last 20 years here in Galway. These are all men that had prostate, have prostate cancer, or hopefully had in many instances. They all chose a particular kind of radiotherapy. They all agreed to... Um, uh, fill out patient-reported outcome measures before and at intervals afterwards. And they all uh, agreed for our, their data to be curated, stored, and reported as though you were doing a clinical trial. So prostate cancer, to set the scene, uh, it's the commonest malignancy in Ireland now. 15.5% of all cancer patients have prostate cancer walking around in the country. This is more than lung and breast uh, now. So it's th uh, there's about nearly 45,000 men alive with prostate cancer. It is a big public health issue. I was involved in some health economics work some years ago. We tried to put a, an effort to cost prostate cancer in Ireland. And you can see back in 2010, it cost something like 47 million to the country. It's now probably closer to 100 million in, in, in current numbers. And we have a huge burden of disease in the west of Ireland for whatever reason. So this is a big deal. You probably know somebody with prostate cancer or somebody in your family has had it and been treated for it. So we picked that as, a, as, a, as an example of how we might try and bend some of these curves around taking data, curating it in a way that makes sense and works, 
um, and then give it back to the patient so we can, we can do a better job with it. So I'm hoping with my friend and colleague Louis here who's going to so help me with it. Could you switch over to the other computer and uh, in the remaining three minutes we'll just show you some real world evidence live uh, and in public for the first time and uh, hopefully I'll have a crack at this. Let's see what happens. Okay, so what's behind this? 1,500 men that I offered brachytherapy to. Brachy is a type of radiation, minimally invasive, one-day procedure. They could have had brachy or they could have had external beam radiotherapy or they could have had surgery to manage their uh, localized disease for cure. But after multidisciplinary work and all the chats that go on in the hospital and the doctor's offices, they elected for brachy and then they dove into our study and started telling us how we did with them. So basically, we've curated this data, we, we've encrypted, encoded, anonymized, de-identified it, etc. It's GDPR compliant, it sits behind all the firewalls it should, and it's safe. And then we did some analytics um, on it, just to see how could we demonstrate this data back to the patient in a way that might help them. So let me just dive straight to the condition insects. And just quickly to explain what you're looking at here, live data in the background, anonymized and safe. There some of the risk factors that allow me to allow us to guide patients as to what treatment they should have um, have to be built into the model, otherwise the model doesn't make sense. So for example, the grade of the tumor is really important. The age of the patient is very important. The PSA level or the prostate specific antigen level is important and a few other factors. Now these aren't the only factors that are important in predicting an outcome in prostate cancer treatment but these are some of them. We have them and we'll just show you the impact they have on the patient. So I use this now with my patients. Imagine they have a, this gentleman is low grade, Gleason's grade group one disease. Imagine he's not 76 but we'll make him 64 and his PSA, he comes in to me, his PSA is 10. 13, whatever it might be, and he's saying, what should I do, Frank, should, should I have surgery, radiotherapy, whatever. And I said, well, look, I can't tell you, ex other than the published literature, I can tell you how you would do with surgery and radiation uh, uh, therapy, but I can tell you specifically how you'll do with brachytherapy if you choose to have it done in this office or in this program. So I hit predict here, and up pops the Kaplan-Meier curve, an event-free survival. And you can see at 60 months, I can say to this gentleman, we haven't treated him yet, but he is exactly like the 439 of the 1,400 men on the data set in that he has these particular risk factors. And I can say if you're this man or like this man, you have a 98% chance of being in remission at five years after brachy in this office. Now, it doesn't say anything about if he has brachy in another office or if he has surgery in next door's office. It's just one doctor's results, one clinic's results in one condition with one treatment. You can imagine the power of this is that if we had all of the radiation results in the country, all of the surgical results in the country, let's imagine we were able to uh, produce, sorry, produce magically surgical results here um, and run the, run the model again. I beg your pardon. I'm, this is my first time doing it. So let's say these are the surgical results. I'm just going to change one of the factors and run the model again. And let's say uh, the patient had surgery versus radiation and Therefore, that produced a slightly better outcome for him. That's important information. I think a patient would want to have that if he could. Then the next question will say is, well, how, what about side effects? What are the risks of this kind of um, treatment in someone like me? And I can run the side effects out on this spider graph over time. So um, if we look here over the first several years after treatment, these are toxicity grades that we have given. And you can see the percentage change over time. So we can say to somebody, look, you have a low risk of rectal problem, low risk of urinary bother, low risk of sexual problems, and these will improve or disimprove over time. That's very helpful. And again, they're specific to this particular patient and this particular treatment. And finally, what, a, what about patient reported outcome measures, kind of the holy grail of quality of measurement? Well, let's look at urinary irritative symptoms. And these are blended means over a number of years after the, a number of months after the treatment. Again, a subset of the patients, not the whole not the whole uh, patient population. But you can see now, these are insights that actually a patient could use to, to make meaningful decisions about what treatment they might have and crucially where they might have that treatment. So what about the physicians looking at the overall quality of the program? This would be the entire patient number. You can see I'm not jerry-rigging these data. This is a good, these are low risk, intermediate risk and high risk patients. These are different treatments they're all getting. And so uh, uh, someone can look in and audit the treatment from the outside. This is the quality of the program. 
And finally, we can look at things like timelines. How long does it take the, to get the patient into the hospital? How long does it take to get an MRI scan, a bone scan, whatever it might be? How quickly can we get the patient through the diagnostic pathway? Because timeliness is, portion, is part of quality as well. So I, if we could change back to the slides, I'll, I'll, I'll get out of the demonstration. Again, to my knowledge, that's not out there. you know. And this isn't about Bracky, and it's not about my practice. This is about giving people real-world evidence that allows them to make a, de a crucial decision around what treatment they should have, number one. And number two, allows them to choose what hospital they should go to, should they stay in. We all in this room, I'm sure, get questions like this. Uncle Billy has prostate cancer. Should he stay in Galway? Should he go to Dublin? Should he have surgery? Should he go to New York? Should whatever. This comes up all the time. This is the sort of data we need to help somebody in a meaningful way, not just you know, uh, give them sort of pat answer to, to that question, which is really important. Um, I don't know, can we go back to the PowerPoint um, slides just to close out? Since I promised you 10 minutes, I hope I'm close to it. Thank you. And thanks, Louis. So one of the barriers here is the data. It's all siloed. It's in paper. It's in multiple different facilities. If we're going to follow Porter's axiom here. We need to gather the data across all of the places where the care is given. We need to take it out of the silos and we need to put it into a portal. And ideally that portal should be available to patients. Now a lot of times people will say, well look, I'm in the Mayo Clinic and we have a portal. Well yeah, you've got a portal that's owned by the Mayo Clinic. And the Mayo Clinic would really like you to stay in the Mayo Clinic for all your services because that's what they'd like you to do. That's how they live and exist. But is that always right for you? What if you want to go to the Cleveland Clinic or you know, the Balina clinic or some other clinic um, around the world. How do you port your information and take it with you uh, in this trend? That's what we need to do. So right now we've got a whole bunch of siloed data. We've got wearable data. I personally am wearing, this is a kind of a 24 hour blood pressure thing and I've got a blood sugar thing, which I won't show you, you'd be glad to know. But they're disconnected from anything. They just sit in kind of my iPhone and they don't really connect to tell me in a connected way what's my metabolic health uh, like. Should I lose a bit of weight? Should I improve my nutrition, my sleep and so on? So wearables are out there floating around there. They're not really connected. Patient data is siloed in the hospitals. But I think if we can connect the data and give it to patients, they can make much better decisions about their care and their outcome. Patients can make better decisions. The healthcare facility can ensure that they're promoting only the best quality of information. And research organizations can enroll patients on studies. We heard institutions that do clinical trials have better outcomes for their patients. And if we're about outcomes, we should be improving enrollment into clinical trials. This is a way to do that. So I'm going to just close with a concept that I haven't seen written down, but I, to me it sort of makes sense, and I'd be interested in what you think. And that's the idea of personalized medicine being bi-directional. It's one thing to know if somebody says, I've got breast cancer, the first question an oncologist will say was, how big was your primary tumor? Did you have nodes? How many were involved? Were they resected? Was there extra capsular extension? Was there ERP or positivity? Was there HER2 positivity? A whole bunch of prognostic factors. And once they know that, they can say, yeah, you should have uh, modified radical mastectomy, radiotherapy, chemo, Herceptin, whatever it might be. That's a generic recipe. The next question though is, okay, but well where should I have that done? Should I stay in Galway? Should I go to Dublin? You know, who's got the best outcomes for this? And critically, we're not measuring outcomes. We're measuring time in the emergency room, number of wheels on the trolley in the corridor. We're measuring, you name it, we're measuring billing information. We're measuring uh, all kinds of financial stuff. But how many of the metrics that we're measuring are truly aimed at improving the outcomes of the patients we're looking at. And that's the challenge. And I think that's um, where I think we have to go if we're going to make changes, if we're going to change the way healthcare is sustainable, managed. Uh, I think this is a, a, a framework that makes sense. I think data management and da data openness and transparency is at its heart. That's a digital problem these days. I think we have to change the way we think. We have to be open and honest about what we're doing and not be afraid to hide away. And for years, I've done this where I said, oh, he doesn't understand how difficult my patients are. I'm not going to tell him what's going on here. I have a really tough life here. 
No, we have to put it out there and let this data speak for itself. We need to focus on conditions, not on institutions, because people go from the Bonds to the Galway Clinic to GUH to Cork to the Matter. They go all over the place. Some go to London, some go to New York. We need to give them the data and allow them to move around. Um, and I think we need to make personalized medicine truly bi-directional. One finger should point at the disease, but one should point at the health system. If we do that, I think we have a shot of improving things. So thank you very much. I hope I did it in time. Okay. Professor Frank Sullivan, that's absolutely fascinating, I must say. Uh, I learned a lot myself. <laughs>